But our next guest is Deborah Lamb, the founding di executive director of the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation, a public-private partnership that invests in innovative pilot projects across the state of Georgia. Deborah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for having me. It's lovely to be here. Great, great. So, Deborah, to start off with, you know, in your title, you're the executive director of the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation. And that particular term, inclusive innovation, caught me. Talk to me about what that is and how cities can use inclusive innovation to improve um, their own standing when it comes to developing a smart city. Yeah, and I, I really like how um, this is a nice segue and continuation from what Richard said earlier in terms of the importance of public-private partnerships and the sizes of communities throughout. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be a large size. Um, for us um, in Georgia, we really uh, were very intentional about how we wanted to innovate. We didn't want to model off of what was what we saw existing, which was a huge range of inequalities and, and other issues. And so so we really thought of what is the best way to bring increased access and opportunities for all Georgians um, to innovate and that innovation isn't an end state, but a way to drive economic and community development. Um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that the process was inclusive and strong and sound and really um, pulled together a much bigger tent. And we believe that by doing this, we would result in a stronger outcome um, in terms of long-term growth um, and community development. Right, right. And when we talk about this uh, topic of community develop and, uh, development in urban cities, we hear this term smart cities. Um, you know, describe for the layman watching right now what a smart city is. Yeah, um, and, and what's great about this is that I, I think, you know, it's a term that uh, is, is doesn't necessarily need to be technology uh, only. Um, and for us, it's a continuous improvement process that starts with the local problem or priority, you know, whatever that is, and think about what are the appropriate tools um, be it technologies, hardware, software, data, um, and that could improve, um, you know, the, the community's quality of life, improve the human condition, or solve whatever problem they have. And this could include anything from, you know, transportation issues about mobility, accessibility. It could include energy efficiencies, water, um, uh, anything, healthcare, you start with thinking about what the problem is, you know, who's there, you know, the greater community. It can't be solved by a singular city. Um, and think more about the private sector, think more about startups, think more about small businesses coming together um, to really work on the problem that ultimately benefits the people. And on this topic of smart cities, based off of your observations, what's working for them and what isn't? What are the pros and cons there? Yeah, well, what's what's been great for us at the Partnership for Inclusive Innovation is that we've, like I said, been able to have a very big tent. So in the traditional innovation space, as, as you probably are familiar with, um, it's it's usually led, you know, only by startups. You, you see a lot of that. And in a lot of the smart city space um, that you're familiar with and, and what was said earlier is that, you know, there's a lot of large cities, um, you know, that the focus is. And what we're saying is that, you know, innovation can happen at many different entities small business, startups, nonprofit groups, local governments, schools, and it can happen at any scale. You don't need to have a certain GDP level or development level. It, it doesn't matter um, that you don't necessarily have um, you know, certain, certain industries. You can really think about what's suitable for that locality and bring people together um, with appropriate um, technologies and tools. And, and that's what we've been able to do at the partnership was galvanize um, a, a, a coalition of civic and corporate leadership to come together and provide pool investments um, to spur economic opportunity, next generation workforce development, and really community driven research um, to allow everyone to think about ways to innovate that would spur growth. 
And, you know, we we're coming out of, or hopefully coming out of this nearly two year global pandemic. I, you know, I know that it's really wreaked havoc on cities as well as rural communities across the country, across the world. But when it comes to smart cities, um, you know, before the pandemic, I remember hearing a lot of experts and reporters talking about the emergence of smart cities, how it, um, you, you know, they relate to emerging 5G technology and such. Um, but that conversation, at least publicly or in the main public realm, seem to um, get a little quieter during the pandemic. How did the pandemic impact the development of smart cities and what has it taught developers of smart cities? I can give you a really good example of what we did in Georgia was to think about connectivity as a research service, uh, as a broader broadband as a research service. And what that means is that we know that at this point, especially given our experience with the pandemic, that we all see connectivity as a public infrastructure. It's as important as running water and electricity. I think it's, it's very hard to find anyone who disagrees with the importance of that in terms of spurring healthcare, um, education, you know, economic development. So that, that's a given. We also know that, you know, whatever happens, there is going to be larger investments made in terms of infrastructure that is related to connectivity. What we're seeing, though, however, is that for a lot of these communities, they're not quite able or ready to capture this opportunity, um, you know, in terms of expertise, in terms of capacity, in terms of, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these communities are, are really trying to support essential services to people. And so, you know, they're not necessarily ready for this large investment towards infrastructure. So what we did actually with the partnership was focus on trying to understand um, each community and meeting them where they are. So we have a team actually um, that's uh, working with a few communities in northern Georgia that's focused on understanding the terrain, um, the local uh, technologies that are necessary to support connectivity. And then once that infrastructure is made, we can then build off of the additional applications. So this includes open source software, additional um, applications applications for education, healthcare, et cetera. So understanding that connectivity isn't just that physical um, infrastructure, it's really thinking about the strategic development, the stakeholder engagement, the necessary planning that's needed up front, but then also maintaining the infrastructure in terms of the ongoing application, the data literacy, the training, the cybersecurity awareness that needs to be done on the back end to ensure that it's a 360 holistic approach when it comes to connectivity. And I don't think that's often done because we're just so focused on just you know, putting the pipes down, if you will. Well, Deborah, this has been a fascinating conversation. I hope we get to continue it in the future. We'll definitely be keeping our eyes on the development of smart cities. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Take care. Take care.